Welcome to CNI session, privacy gaps in, in mediated library services, and a follow on, some suggestions about what to do with them. I'm Michael Altman, I'm director of research for the, the newly named Center for Research in Equitable and Open Scholarship at the MIT Libraries. Uh, this is joint work with Kit Haynes, who's a student, <coughs> Katie Zimmerman, a colleague at the MIT Libraries, uh, Lisa Hinchcliffe at the University of Illinois, uh, who will present how to... I'll, I'll talk about some of the problems and then my colleagues will talk about how to solve them. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in diving into some of the, the problems, this paper is not yet out, but a lot of related work on privacy is, and we'll have a, a white paper version of at least the first part by the beginning of the year. So some brief background, um, libraries and privacy. Uh, oddly enough, libraries have cared about uh, privacy for, for a fairly long time. Uh, and um, this comes from, from at least two different sources in the, uh, in the international Sotnefei library tradition. Uh, privacy is viewed as a human right uh, that come, it's part of the universal declaration of, of human rights. Um, and there, is a, there are relate, rights related to it. And it's also a right that's implied by the right to access information and right to free expression. If you can't access that information in privacy, then you may you may be subject to chilling effects, to retribution, and the like. The U.S. has a uh, different tradition of privacy. Um, American libraries recognize the right to privacy within the library context <coughs> since 1939. Uh, have and its its relationship to freedom of expression, freedom of uh, freedom of access to ideas, privacy and confidentiality are are identified in the list of core library values by ARL by ALA. Uh, and it's based around a, a professional value of supporting free inquiry. But unlike the uh, international tradition, there's, there's no human right of privacy that's recognized in the US. Uh, the legal tradition and the, and the rights tradition is more of a, a mosaic or sometimes passion. So legal, uh, <coughs> legal requirements for libraries vary all over the place. If, uh, you're serving, in, if you're internationally located, you're serving uh, an international, um, international audience, which we increasingly do, whether or not we do that deliberately, uh, we may be uh, subject to laws such as the GDPR, the General Data Privacy Regulations, which covers uh, EU and EU citizens, provides a host of rights for data protection, data privacy. Uh, if you're primarily U.S., having U.S. patrons, um, there's no equivalent of the GDPR. Uh, there are some protections for library patrons under 13, under, under COPPA. Uh, the Patriot Act may require disclosure of information on the, on the other side. Many of us are in the <coughs> universities, which work under FERPA, which has privacy rights for students. <laughs> uh, and state laws also across the U.S. vary in, in their protection from uh, they may have separate information data protection laws in which that apply to information collected in libraries and or specific library information laws, most of which are uh, keep the library's information protected from open records requests. And here are some examples of state laws. Uh, and we can also be under different contractual obligations. If we're processing financial information, PCI DSS protects uh, personal data, and vendor contracts may as well. So there's a, there's a, a mixed background. There's a deep set of values that library 
have with the respect to privacy, uh, but there's a mixed set of, of formal law and regulation. And over time, our model of accessing information has changed, as has been noted. Uh, one of some of the implications of this change, as more and more content has become digitized or available in more digital form, is that more of more content, more interactions are not taking place in the library itself. It may be taking place in uh, in a patron's office or a patron's home or a third place. They may not be interacting with content that is held and controlled by the library. Maybe information that the library has acquired rights to, mediated access to, <coughs> but is housed, accessed from a third party. And even the systems that we use to, to inter, uh, manage interactions with our content and our patrons may be hosted in the cloud somewhere. We may not be running those. So we are interested in how privacy it, protection in libraries has changed or maybe should change in light of some of these shifts. Um, so we, the, the other part of the background, and it'll explain where we're focusing is that, again, no surprise to most of you, in the last 30 years, there's been somewhat of, of a concentration of scholarly communications. So a lot of the content that, at least in university libraries and research libraries, patrons are accessing come from a handful of publishers and much of that content they access through portals provided by those publishers. Maybe mediated, bought, uh, enabled by libraries, but the interactions may occur elsewhere. So we did some research. We looked at vulnerabilities in two areas. One in what information can we see being collected, and then what do publisher privacy policies say they can do with such information? How strong are the, are the protections that they give in writing? Uh, it turned out that the, uh, the first is a lot easier to do than the second. Um, and we're interested in, are there systematic gaps? Are protections different for things that we keep versus vendors? what practices are necessary, how are changes affecting things. Those are broader questions we may do. But here's an example of a use scenario, and I use MIT because that's where I live. Um, patron might use the MIT library system on our, our website to discover a journal to which MIT has provided mediated access. The patron authenticates through their ID <coughs> gateway, accesses the journal through an MIT proxy. Perhaps. This is one, one round. Uh, content is provided with your third party website, perhaps through that proxy, which may lead to further discuss, discovery, exploration, navigation. Uh, and content may be presented inside of a, through that site, through a proprietary embedded reading. So, what's potentially exposable here? Well, they typically don't get the Right off the client's name and MIT ID. They're coming through a proxy. So we don't necessarily get that. But there's a lot they can get. They get there's an IP address, that might be the IP of the proxy. Okay. Uh, there are cookies. Hmm. Well, maybe those are local to this system. Um, there is a browsing history. Um, their reading and sharing history, if they start to log into that reading app. Um, there's also the ability to do fingerprinting of the browser characteristics. So without having a name and ID associated with it, from the information in that transaction, you may be able to figure out this person is the same person that hit you at seven other places. And also, you've got their name from this service over here. You may easily be able to be identified. Um, and if you can do that, you can target advertisements. You could um, recognize the, recommend things that they like. That would be good. You could also uh, attempt to insert more tracking uh, thing technology into their browsers, so you can learn more about them. Uh, 
right now we can we can't see what's going on at the publisher site once it goes to their server but we can see what's happening on on the browser so we can see what tracking mechanisms are used there though not everything that's being done with that information and there are a number of different tracking mechanisms or things that might protect a little bit about tracking HTTP is good because that protects against third parties altogether different outside from, from <coughs> trying to track. Um, but we look for things like ad placements, loading external resources, cookies, whether you got directed to a proprietary reader app that required a login, and other things like active attempts to fingerprint. Thing, JavaScript that does active analysis of the browser to try and figure out who you are, which goes beyond collecting and passive information. And there are a number of tools that let you do this. Some of this ad pops up. You can see that by visual inspection or the intraocular impact test. Um, Privacy Badger is one plugin that will alert you of some of these things. Dev tools in browsers and and the Brave browser is a browser that's explicitly implemented to help you figure out when you're tracked. And we used all of these things. Um, these rows are different technologies. Um, white is good, black is bad. So encryption is good and if it's on, everything else is bad if it's all the way on. Um, columns are tracking how much with what uh, sorry columns are different vendors uh, so this vendor is tracking a lot so is this one um, these are not so much though there's a little weakness in using encryption by the way this is Elsevier this is ProQuest there's a difference in the pattern overall <coughs> do we see this difference in policy as well, and then the legal protections. So this is some of the things that are active traces that vendors, in some cases, are trying very actively to collect information. Um, how would do we evaluate the strength of the legal protections that they're offering? This is a more complicated question than just looking at the tracking mechanisms. Uh, we used four steps. We identified a reference framework for what what privacy principles are, and, uh, and guarantees are we, we trying ideally to, to measure? Uh, and we took these, as you'll see, from the NISO principles, from ALA guidelines, and from some of the, the larger, the more granular GDPR protections. We, how do we, uh, we, we need to merge these and deduplicate. So we harmonized across this, this set. And we'll show you that a little bit of that harmonization. And then develop the measurement instrument, which is basically a, a, a well worded question that we can evaluate via disagree, agree, or disagree um, about how strong that, that guarantee of that particular protection is. Uh, and then we conducted repeated assessments, repeated assessments, uh, repeated over time. So we have some before the GDPR privacy policies came in, which we'll discuss, won't discuss much, but will be in the paper and after. And we repeated across multiple vendors and we repeated across multiple raters to make sure that we did consistent ratings. For iterator reliability, as they say. So, for the top level framework, we're we're using we're, we we organize things around the NISO principles, uh, and after looking at these very various number of frameworks, this turned out to be a a, a good set of, of top level categories for uh, most of the most of the requirements that were in other. Frameworks guidelines could be fit in at a at a broad level into the into the NISO principles, um, and they come out of the library community, so that's nice. These are these are the uh, 
11 principles. I'm not going to iterate through all of them, but they include everything from accountability to, to security to education. Um, and here's an example of a uh, particular principle statement. These are not very, at that level, they're not very detailed. Right? They're broad statements. So we went to guidelines like the ALA guidelines and, and privacy and security checklists and the GDPR requirements, which are stated in more detail. And there are some examples. And we developed across them. So under a NISO principle, shared privacy responsibilities, it contains several, uh, several different um, protections. One of them is training, that people who are uh, in library systems, in, in data controller organizations, should have security and privacy training. Uh, we map that wording. There is a, uh, in this case, there's an analog to GDPR section uh, and a rough analog to LA section. Rinse, lather, repeat. And we end up with approximately 40 different scoring areas. And I won't <coughs> bore you with all of those. Uh, but the, the over, uh, at the top level, they fit quite well. Uh, NISO, the NISO principles are a bit more uh, <coughs> comprehensive than the ALA principles, and sometimes a bit more detailed. Uh, GDPR ha goes down into more specific requirements, as you might expect. And we don't go down to the bottom level, but we go down to approximately the article level. Uh, and, and goes beyond NISO in a couple of ways. One is to specify vulnerable, specific vulnerable populations. Do you, um, beyond, beyond children, which is something that, that COPPA addresses. To do the evaluation, we harvested privacy policies from each vendor, froze them so we would have a common, a common copy because they are changing all the time. <laughs> Went through each sub-principle, <coughs> designed a question around it by modifying the, the core of the NISO text and adding any, if, if necessary, specific additional protections from more specific regs like GDPR. Converted that to a statement that you can agree or disagree with. This, and the idea is that we don't know how well the vendor actually protects these. We are evaluating what the policy <coughs> promises to do, whether the policy describes what they're doing in this issue or <coughs> promises to protect it in a particular way. How it's actually protected, this is not an audit. Right? Any statement you that you anything you can make in a statement, you can agree or disagree with any statement. We use a standard five-point scale. It's called a Likert scale, it has some like properties. And then have independent coders rank these, compare for iterator reliability. And which we are still iterating on, but the initial uh, ranks are quite, are, are quite good. We will we will refine it a bit. So we've gone through uh, two based on a, a previous version of the instrument, uh, which was not as detailed. We looked at what might be were the emerging uh, best and worst players and use this revised instrument with more detail on multi-rater uh, multi raters. One is the best score that you can get, um, and five is the worst. Five is very much disagree that they met this criteria. Um, ProQuest gets a solid B. That's very scientific. <laughs> um, the, three, the three is science, the B was 
Arca. Elsevier gets approximately a D minus. Um, of course, you can tell the fine detail here with the red is Elsevier, polar is worse, blue is ProQuest. Generally, ProQuest is doing better in almost everything. There are a couple of things that they just forgot altogether, <coughs> which is why they both get fives. Um, and if they, you know, had ProQuest had, a, my, my guess is that if ProQuest had, had a little <coughs> bit more detail in describing some areas there, the score would be, the score would be even lower. There would be a bigger, uh, a bigger positive uh, bonus for them. Uh, but Elsevier is pretty good about telling you that they're going to collect, uh, the, reason that, the reason they didn't get a five uh, is that they're pretty good at telling you that they're going to collect everything. They're comprehensively telling you the information they're going to collect, which is everything. Which means not, not, not just everything that like you give them, but they're going to go and buy information from third parties. They're going to, they are going to instrument your browser and try to track you. They tell you all that. Right. Um, and they're pretty clear about what they're going to do with it, which is anything. Which includes <laughs> defending their intellectual privacy. Uh, property rights with third parties or with you, anything they like. So you know, so points they do get points for um, for disclosure, um, but points off for not actually protecting the information in the way that that our our library principles and, and values would house. Here's a, a drill in for that anything and everything. Um, here's a, a snippet of the. Also, the ProQuest privacy. Um, it's better in a number of ways. Um, first of all, the language is, is much simpler, easier to understand. They do drill into the detail of what they do in, in later in the document. Um, they frame it as your rights over the data versus we're collecting everything. They use they describe a data minimization approach. So there's a lot to like here. There are also some blind spots and lack of lack of lack of detail in different areas. But it is significantly better. Um, what about the GDPR? Right. What about the GDPR? Well, this is this is post. We did these analysis for the post GDPR policies. Those are the ones that you saw. We also looked at the, the pre-GDPR policies, but we haven't gone back and done the revised instrument with multi-code reliability. Um, but Elsevier, the post-GDPR Elsevier is still lousy, like you saw. And one of the reasons is because laws can change, and that cha drives changes in compliance, but it doesn't necessarily drive changes in protection or protection for, for you. Uh, and so you know, Elsevier says, you have the right under European and certain other privacy and data protection laws, as may be applicable, to request access to and correction deletion of your personal information, restriction of processing, objective processing, portability. So you can request it. They don't have like an interface to actually control it. It's not like Google, the Google data management where you can turn off the data collection and take out your, you know, take out, take out your SMS texts and move them somewhere else, but you can at least request it if you're a European citizen and you know, and if they decide that law applies. So they're doing what is necessary for compliance and your your rights have increased if you you are subject to if you're subject to GDPR, then you have more rights now. You have to. But there this is this is a narrowly tailored expansion. Some discussion recommendations. So a summary of, of what we found descriptive. Increasingly, there's a misalignment between stated library values in privacy and data protection and privacy practices. Why is that? Because a lot of the way this, that people are accessing content are in ways that we don't control us directly. So that has been maybe a blind spot. Um, data collection, broad assertions of broad use, uh, broad and, and active tracking are very common in this space. Um, and this open access doesn't protect you. If open access is on a publisher site that is um, 
that has bad practices, they're applying those tracking practices in the OA side as well. Some publishers do better than others. Look like the, the content portals like EBSCO and ProQuest were doing less tracking than even for content that came from the original publisher, so it matters which route you come to. And Elsevier appears to be the most invasive in terms of their practices. There is a difference between law and your legal protection. The, the laws currently provide inconsistent protection because there's a patchwork of regulations that apply. Licenses provide little additional protection, in part because much of this data is not passed from the library to the vendor, in which case some of these, these writers might help that we already have, but is collected by the vendor itself as part of their processes even though the library may have paid for the service and directed the user to it, branded it, et cetera. And the licenses are not built from the top up or bottom, uh, top down on privacy values and principles as we now understand. So there, there are a number of areas which my colleagues will talk about in which licenses could be improved, and this may be a low hanging fruit, uh, improving, making them less opaque Patients don't even know what we've negotiated <coughs> for them. They all, all they see is the publisher click-throughs, generally, which are lousy. Current licenses are inconsistent, um, which makes them harder to interoperate, harder for patrons to understand. And current licenses don't <coughs> support evaluation. It may be difficult to evaluate compliance or to or even to get the data back that is being collected to see how users are interacting with those sites and whether there's some, some issue, whether they're opting in or not. Um, and just as a baseline, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Marshall Breeding did, a, did a, a quick look at privacy policy, privacy practices on uh, ARL libraries and um, we're not, uh, library hosted systems probably aren't doing so well either. But we're not actively <coughs> Tracking them in the same way. There may be opportunities for designing privacy mechanisms into the way that we we interact with vendors. Right now, um, there is no support for uh, privacy protected machine learning. If you want a recommendation recommendation system, you have to give your personal data. There are ways. To, there are ways to give good recommendations without revealing your personal information. Things like differential privacy or cryptographic tools for that. Similarly, there are ways to access gated resources without having, by giving tokens, without having to, to provide your identity. So, but, so there may be, be mechanisms that would enable users to protect themselves or uh, libraries to, to protect users more, but they would need to be architected in that system. And then there's a, a question about awareness and consent and control. Even when a user patron has a, uh, a sorry, university has a contract with a vendor that provides some protections to data collected from users, um, that might not be known to the patron that can't act accordingly. Uh, if they know that there's such a policy, often they can't view it. That policy might be unavailable. It might even be, that contract might even be proprietary. You're not allowed to share the, your, your contract with the vendor of others. Uh, and, and it's almost certainly not presented to the patron when they're accessing the, the vendor systems. Uh, and there may be conflicts. If, if the library contract says, you, sh you should treat the data just as we would, but the terms of service says click through and you agree that Elsevier can do whatever you want and they click through because it's their site. Which wins? It's not clear. Probably, the, probably the, in, in lack of, of anything else, lack of better licensed terms, it probably is the vendor policy that wins. So they're not designed in a way that makes them effective in uh, either understanding or in controlling <laughs> in this environment. So patrons access content that are, is purchased, mediated, even branded by research institutions, by library, but it may not be protected by 
by the policies that we would like or that would that that we have in place if they were accessed solely through alarm systems. And we need to design in some protections. It's not something, not everything can be bolted on afterwards. We have to, uh, there are opportunities to improve accessibility of services for human and machine clients and to explicitly support affordances for privacy, like anonymous but authenticated grounds or privacy preserving recommendation systems that would enable more ways of interacting than simply going through the, the <coughs> publisher's UI and being subject to all of the, the tracking mechanisms there. And we very much need a, a standardized model of community license. That's aligned with collaborative principles, that's transparent and verifiable, and that is, is consistent for all of the patrons, whether they're in Europe or they're coming from Arkansas, or um, and is also understandable so that people don't have to think, well, am I in the EU zone? Do I care? Because these, these, are, these can be very long and difficult to, to understand. So that, those are all the problems. Here are some references and now to solve everything for you. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, I'm Lisa Janicki Hinchliffe. I'm the coordinator for information literacy services and instruction at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, this session that we proposed um, and then kind of got combined together turned out fortuitous, I think, because one of the things that came out of the National Forum on Web Privacy and Web Analytics that was held earlier this year at Montana State University. And I wanted particularly to pause for a moment and give credit to Scott Young, who is the PI on this project with his colleagues at Montana State, brought us together. Lots of good ideas coming out of that symposium. But this particular idea seemed sort of like actionable in the sense of it's very concrete, which is perhaps if we don't like what we are finding happening under the contracts that we negotiate, we should negotiate for something else. Um, and so go ahead and click. Um, we, um, I'm gonna have Katie talk for a little bit and then we're hoping to have a little bit of a discussion. Okay, so hi, I'm Katie Zimmerman. I'm a licensing librarian at MIT. I'm also a scholarly communications <laughs> librarian. Um, so I negotiate a lot of these licenses for MIT. Um, I also happen to have a law degree. People seem to find that important. Um, <laughs> so our proposal that, we, that we're hoping we will get some input on today is to develop and maintain a system of uh, model privacy language for, uh, for user privacy. So to address these concerns so that we're not relying on the user, on the uh, vendor privacy policies, which change all the time, and as we've seen, are not terribly effective. Um, so. If we don't like what they're doing, we should do it ourselves. We, we should do it better. This should be, um, as Micah mentioned, this, this seems like it should be a low-hanging fruit. This is something that the library community has done before and done well. Uh, we have lib license. We have other model licenses. Um, this is something we have the expertise to do this, so we really should. Um, it facilitates communication and improves the efficiency in negotiations as if there's something that has a community consensus already built up that you can just say, hey, can you adopt this? Then that, then that makes it much easier to actually get it in there. It also makes it easier for the vendors to comply with if everyone's asking for the same thing instead of implementing a specific thing. If you're asking them to like actually put in tech work and do a specific one-off thing just for you, you're probably not gonna get that. But if, it's the same th if everyone's asking for the same thing, then we can actually get, get some change. Um, and it provides a consistent message. It's, it's a way to let the vendors know that this is important to libraries and that this is what we want going forward. Um, so starting points, the starting points are largely what Micah talked about. Um, so the NISO, the NISO framework, um, the ALA privacy guidelines, GDPR, NIST privacy framework, and the existing model privacy language. So I do want to acknowledge that there is um, user privacy in, um, clauses in most of the, I actually haven't looked at them all, but maybe all of them, um, all of the existing model model licenses, but there are still some gaps. So um, the lib license language, for example, is pretty good on um, uh, what vendors can, restricting vendors from passing data to third parties, but it doesn't really mention what the vendor is doing themselves. So if so Elsevier can't outsource that, but they can do whatever analytics they want on you themselves, which 
They probably are. Um, but that that is a that is a basis that we can work from. Uh, next slide. Um, and areas of consideration components. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because I think it's more important to talk about it. But um, the things that have been identified in um, in the project that I'm working on with Micah are things that we should be addressing in this language. So this um, came out of, as I said, the forum at Montana State. But one of the big takeaways was um, Lisa and Katie probably shouldn't sit down and write model license language, <laughs> especially Lisa. <laughs> um, and so how exactly, so in part of the question is, you know, a bunch of us, five of us decided this was our passion project when we were in a room for two days, but we wanted to get some feedback from the larger community on the desirability of this, the feasibility, and then sort of like, what would it take to actually operationalize creating this kind of vital language? Where does it get hosted? Um, how do we do this as a community? So though we have other examples, we don't want to assume that just because somebody has hosting some other model license language, they'd like to host this too. Um, but so this is really the open time for comments, questions, problem posing, um, thoughts. I think literally, yeah. That's Thank you, everyone. Thank you.